from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 11 starts now. Light snow showing up on 4 Live Radar, and it looks like we could be seeing even more for the morning commute. Kim? Sex on a plane. Two people busted on a flight to Detroit and arrested at Metro Airport. But we're going to begin with breaking news from southwest Detroit, where a woman wanted for assault escapes from police custody. Good to have you with us tonight at 11. Right now, that wanted woman is on the run, I guess you'd say, with handcuffs for bracelets. She was able to escape because of a wild turn of events at the scene. Tim Pamplin is there with the night cam. Tim? Well, you join us as more police officers start running across Fort Street here. This is Fort Dragoon, southwest Detroit. The lady is still in handcuffs somewhere in this neighborhood, police believe. Now, let's get to the video. That white car on the right, police had that car pulled over. The driver was wanted. Felony breaking and entering warrants. While police are dealing with him, the lady walks into the gas station. There she is, bright orange shirt, frosty dreads. She's talking to the clerk when this white man walks in with a gas can. Within a couple of seconds, she starts berating him and fists start flying. They start tussling, customers trying to get in the gas station. Please see this. They come and get her. They put her in handcuffs outside and then walk her back into the store. While all this is going on, the felon who was originally stopped goes into cardiac arrest. The two police officers now have two situations. One clearly takes precedent over the other. They were distracted dealing with this man in medical distress, while this lady in handcuffs simply walks away. Well, that brought out the troops, didn't it? Helicopters in the sky. We have Homeland Security, Detroit Police, Michigan State Police, even the Border Protection are scouring this area. Again, this lady is loose in the neighborhood, still wearing her handcuffs. Police would like them back, and they would like to talk to her. That's the scene in Southwest Detroit tonight. With the night camp, Tim Pamplin, Local 4. Oh boy. Okay, Tim, thank you. It's abundantly clear that winter is coming and there are flurries out there tonight, Ben. Yeah, it seems like it's just around the corner and it's just a little shocking to see blue <laughs> on the radar. <laughs> But there it is on 4 Live Radar. Even though none of our reporting stations have come up with snow just yet, uh, it looks like this batch in the western part of Oakland County around Milford Commerce is sort of in between Howell and Waterford. So uh, we may be seeing some uh, reported up in Pontiac here within the next few minutes. Otherwise, let's turn our attention to tomorrow morning. Here's what the model has. By the time we get into 5 a.m., it looks like we could see a renewed push of moisture. This does look like it's going to stay north of 96. And again, we're not anticipating any significant accumulation, but there may be enough to coat the grass in some spots or maybe even a mailbox or some of the decks. And uh, by the time we get towards eight, nine o'clock, this starts fading away and we turn our attention to what's coming for Halloween. But the morning temperatures will be in the mid thirties. We'll rise to 40 there at noon and we will talk more about your Halloween forecast coming up in a few minutes. Also, don't forget to download our local forecasters app tomorrow starting at three o'clock. Get half hourly updates with our freaky forecast only on our local forecasters app. Kim. Thank you, Ben. The dangerous quest to join what's known as the Mile High Club has landed another couple in hot water. This time it was on a Delta flight from L.A. to Detroit. Two people were busted on the flight yesterday. Jason Colthorpe is live at Metro Airport with the story. And Jason, we can't even describe what was going on on that plane. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, we're going to give it a brief mention and be very careful with the details for sure, Kim. And you're right, it raises a lot of eyebrows, this situation, and maybe mostly because, as it's explained by police to us, these two people were total strangers when they boarded the flight in L.A., but clearly it was love at first flight. They were strangers on a plane, but not for long. Police say at some point early Sunday afternoon on a flight from L.A. to Detroit, a 48-year-old woman was caught performing oral sex on a 28-year-old man in their seats. The woman was connecting to Nashville and the man to Miami. Both were given citations when the plane landed in Detroit, and the case was handed over to the FBI. The act within itself, within itself is very inappropriate in a public place. Travelers I spoke with see both the seriousness of this and the, well, the what have you. <laughs> After the weekend that we, we just had. We did a fantasy fest, so that's nothing. Square. Jokes about earning sky miles aside, most agree there are others on board to consider. Their children, their families, our seniors, these things should be respected. Especially with like families and children around, I feel like well, that's now, definitely. Were they on the side with two seats, or were they like three across with a, a spectator? No, that still should not matter. <laughs> no, definitely inappropriate. 
The FBI tells Local 4 it is still investigating this, and these two could be charged with anything from a misdemeanor all the way to a felony. If people will go so far as to disrespect themselves and disrespect you, something should be done immediately. And it could be done immediately. Uh, we have been told the FBI uh, could uh, bring charges in this case as early as tomorrow. We don't know again what those charges might be. Also, we reached out to Delta tonight for comment, and they kindly said no comment. Uh, we're at Metro Airport. Jason Coulthorpe, back to you. And so, Jason, is this a federal case, or will there be local charges? You mentioned the FBI. It's a federal case, and the way uh, the FBI explains it is as soon as that door closes on the plane, everything is federal. You're under national laws, and that's why uh, once they got to Detroit, they were cited. That could change to an arrest as this case moves forward, depending on what those charges are. Of course, we'll be following that for you. Yeah. Kim? Okay. Thanks, Jason. Devin? You already know you're paying some of the highest auto insurance rates in the country. There is a move in the works in Lansing to change that, but there's also a movement against the bill and the way it's written. Business editor Rob Maloney live tonight with that part of the story. Rod? Devin, you want to spark a lively conversation? Just talk about our no-fault insurance rates here in Michigan, particularly here in the city of Detroit. A hot, hot issue to say the least. And the bill to try and change all of that is making its way through Lansing. But like you said, there is opposition rising and we saw it tonight in Plymouth Township. Brighton House Republican Insurance Committee Chair Lana Thies travels the state talking about the insurance bill, cobbled together with Mayor Mike Duggan's help, and says it's getting heavy support. So a vocal anti-insurance bill rally outside the Plymouth Public Library came as a bit of a surprise to her. They believe that she and the mayor need to go back to the drawing board. So inside, Thies explained the bill's intricacies, how instead of mandatory payments to deal with catastrophic injury, reduced costs come when relying on drivers' health care plans. We are mandating that they purchase the highest insurance coverage in the country, regardless of whether or not that's something they want to do. And I believe that Michigan citizens should have the opportunity to make that choice. She spoke to a group dependent on those lifetime benefits, and they are not buying. Mary Pine's been in not one, but two auto accidents causing traumatic brain injury, and she's needed constant and costly therapy. There's so many facets to this that if you rush into this solution and you don't give good data, it's not a good solution, and you're fooling people. Arnie Grinblatt of West Bloomfield claims to spend his time researching Michigan's insurance program and said from his wheelchair, legislators need to know this. This bill is not going to help out their constituents. It's not going to help out the state of Michigan. It's not going to lower premiums. It's just going to side with increased profits for the insurance companies. And so we'll see this battle play out this week. The House is going to vote Thursday on the bill. But I've had a chance to talk to Arlen Mikoff, the uh, Senate Majority Leader. He told me that he feels that the House bill only shifts costs. It doesn't really solve the problem. And so for all intents and purposes, the House bill can't get through the Senate. So where does that take us? We don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Reporting live downtown, Rod Maloney, Local 4. Okay, Rod, on this night before Halloween, Angels Night volunteers are on patrol hoping to ward off arsonists. Uh, we were there as people were signing up to help at the Kroll Community Center on Detroit's west side. They'll spend the night outside the night working to keep the streets safe. Well, we now know who okayed a Spirit of Detroit award for rapper Cardi B. Cardi B posted a thank you message on Instagram over the weekend as she held the award. But critics say she's from New York and has done nothing for the city of Detroit. Detroit's city council released a statement tonight saying anyone can be honored with the Spirit of Detroit award. Radio station 1075 requested one for Cardi B and council president Brenda Jones honored that request. Mystery solved. There you go. He is at the center of an investigation into Russian meddling in our election, but he's bringing a lot of attention to Metro Detroit. Yeah, while a local accountant is answering questions about a former Trump campaign aide in just a minute. Also, they were recently named the angriest drivers in the country, and now we know why. A wild case of road rage in Hawaii caught on camera. That's next. But first, pilots popping pills and flying high. I wouldn't want somebody driving an aircraft, driving a car, whatever, being high on, you know, pain pills. The feds are changing the way they test pilots, but is it enough? The Defenders, next. The Morning Team. Tonight, the Defenders expose a serious lapse in drug testing for airline pilots. Right now, they're not being tested for some of the most addictive painkillers on the market. 
Government says it's working to fix that, but will not test for one of the biggest opioid killers. Defender Kevin Dietz reports why top safety officials say it should be. A plane takes off from Detroit Metro Airport. It's a scene that takes place 75,000 times every day in America as aircraft filled with passengers crisscross the country. The pilots responsible for the lives of the passengers are not drug tested for many popular opiates. 64,000 people die every year from opiate overdose. The first reaction anyone has is how could this possibly be bad? Doctors familiar with opiate abuse know the dangers of addiction. Those hooked have a terrible time getting clean and it can happen to anyone, including pilots. Two more lives lost to America's opioid addiction. Courtney Holly and her husband Brian, a captain with Spirit Airlines. Two of 20,000 fentanyl overdoses in 2016. Fentanyl claims more lives than any other type of opioid, and there is no plan in place to test it for pilots anytime soon. That worries passengers. With the epidemic that it is in society today, why wouldn't, why wouldn't we? Right now, pilots are tested for alcohol and drugs like marijuana, cocaine, heroin, meth, and PCP. But some of the most popular prescription drugs are not on the list. Because of governmental bureaucracy and battles with the unions, adding new drugs to be tested for takes time. It's been many years since the testing policy has been adjusted. The feds say very soon they will add four new opiate prescription medications, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, and oxymorphone. That would catch most of the popular painkillers. If you're gonna go looking for them, once you find them, you really need to know to be responsible to society and to the flying public on what to do next. While everyone agrees we don't want pilots high on pills, doctors and union officials warn that testing for prescription drugs is an imperfect science. Medications under a doctor's care can be perfectly safe and should be allowed. Insisting finding abuse is not as easy as a blood or urine test. The question is, does the value of the blood test or urine test alone have adequate significance to ground a pilot or to clear a pilot? The feds say in the next few months they will work out the details and insist on the testing. But even though the top boss at the National Transportation Safety Board is in favor of adding fentanyl to the list, it will not be. She says, unfortunately, fentanyl was not the epidemic it is today when the new drugs to be tested for were agreed on. Passengers are not feeling good about the politics behind drug testing. Well, they have many lives and, you know, that they're responsible for. And the testing policy is not just for pilots flying planes. It also covers trains, big trucks, and ships. While the NTSB admits it cannot keep up with the changing abuse trends, they want to remind all of us that 99% of those tested do pass their drug test. The plan to test for opiates is already way behind schedule. Experts say putting fentanyl into the argument would only delay things further. They expect the current proposal will get pushed through and the fight over fentanyl will have to wait for another day. Kevin Dietz, Defenders. Yet one more wrinkle to the opioid crisis. Here's what Karen Drew's working on for tomorrow night at 11. They're on the hunt for treasure. Oh my God, that's a scary one. <laughs> and look at their stash. Laid there for 155 years until we came along and found it. We'll tell you where to look in Metro Detroit. Well, it, it looks old. We'll take you treasure hunting tomorrow at 11. Well, we'll talk about Yes, you snuck that snow word in on us earlier, but first, <laughs> check this out yeah. in Luddington. Of all the things we had to deal with today, this was not one of them. Uh, this is over in Luddington. It's a water spout uh, that came in off of Lake Michigan. Uh, this is that time of year where we see the water temperatures in the mid 50s. You have the air temperatures yeah, yeah, in the 30s. Yeah. And that difference in, in temperature really uh, that fuels so that cool. rotation. Always feels better when they're out over uh -huh. the water where they're not <laughs> usually doing as much trouble. True. Yeah. Usually they don't do a whole lot of damage, yeah. but it is possible. Uh, and Devin and Kim, just in case you were thinking about trick-or-treating between the 6 and 11 tomorrow night. Costumes uh, ready. There you go. This is for you. Uh, <laughs> that candy bag doesn't fill itself, buddy. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll put a lot of those Reese's Outrageous in your bag <laughs> tomorrow night. Uh, temperatures will be falling into the 30s once the sun goes down. And even though those are going to be
to be the colder temperatures. If you want to trick or treat when it's warmer, you may have to contend with a few raindrops, at least in the uh, 5 to 6 p.m. hours. Wind chills are going to be in the 30s, feeling near freezing for most of the evening tomorrow night. So let's move forward to what's going on right now. Four Live Radar has been showing these colors all night, and it looks like some of the uh, snow returns are starting to weaken, but we have been getting light rain reports. Temperatures are in the upper 30s uh, across most of the uh, northern section of the area. There you see 38 in Howell, 38 also in Pontiac. Mount Clements is at 39. So generally, this is probably going to be mostly rain for the next hour or so. But once we get past midnight, then all bets are off. Wind chills have dipped down into the 20s. Pontiac still have gusts approaching 20 miles an hour in spots. Last week, if you joined us on storm pins, we showed you doggy camouflage. So uh, equal opportunities here. It's kitty camo on uh, storm pins tonight. This is Charlie and uh, he's blending in with the leaves. He doesn't look super happy about that pumpkin. <laughs> back though. <laughs> I don't know. Our cats don't look super happy in general, but anyway, let's talk about tomorrow as we look at those snow showers in the morning. Morning commute could be seeing a couple of those flakes. Most of these are going to be north of 96. Again, we're not really anticipating any huge problems with travel in the morning. Just some noticeable flakes, especially in the northern part of the area. Those fade and then we have a trough coming through in the afternoon, but temperatures will be warm enough that this is going to be generally light rain. You can see some purple may get a little bit of sleet mixed in there, but generally this is going to be rain. And as we said, should be all gone by about 8 o'clock tomorrow evening. So it's going to be a blustery and chilly Halloween uh, for those who venture out tomorrow. 35 tonight, few of those snow showers around. A lot of us are going to be down near the freezing mark when we wake up tomorrow morning. As far as high temperatures go, 43 looks about as good as it gets, and that's when we'll start seeing those rain showers develop. Let's look at trick or treat temperatures in your four zone forecast. This is a snapshot of about 7 p.m. tomorrow. We'll be right around 40, and remember, wind chills are going to be pretty much around 32 at this time. Air temperatures anywhere between 36 and 40 here in our south zone. West zone, it's all 30s tomorrow at 7 o'clock. 36 in Howell, Milford, same number, and same goes in Clarkson. And when you get into our north zone, we're looking at temperatures mid to upper 30s here at 7 p.m. as well. Warmer numbers are coming towards the end of the forecast. In fact, we're going to hit the 60s three times there, Thursday, Sunday, and Monday. Don't forget to set your clocks back this weekend before you head to bed. Daylight saving time comes to an end on Sunday morning. And here's tonight's Halloween house hunt. We go out to Farmington Hills. This is on Hall Cummins <laughs> Drive. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, spooky the ghosts. ghosts in the Pretty good, yeah. Skeletons. Yeah, yeah, all kinds of stuff. We've seen a lot of good houses. Yeah. Could, uh, a couple more before the week is Good complex lighting scheme there. Very good. <laughs> all right, Ben. They are the essential foods for a healthy pregnancy, but could they be hurting your chances of starting a family? New study about fruits and vegetables raising some eyebrows. We'll have that when we come right back. A financial planner from Novi has suddenly become very popular, but it's all a case of mistaken identity. His name is George Papadopoulos, same name as the former campaign advisor to President Trump. Today, the latter Papadopoulos uh, was announced and pleaded guilty to lying to the feds about his contacts with Russia. But thousands of people on Twitter have mistakenly been slamming the Novi Papadopoulos. Today, he tweeted this, for the nth time, I am not Trump's foreign policy advisor. I have no association with the Trump camp None. Well, as we await snow, it's hard to believe anyone would be angry in Hawaii, but at least one driver there has some road rage. It started when a pickup truck cut off the car. That car did not like being cut off, and video shows the driver purposely slamming into that pickup truck Go ahead. twice. Go ahead. Police are still investigating. Now to good health, we all know fruits and vegetables are essential for a healthy pregnancy. But according to a new study, pesticides found on those fruits and vegetables can affect fertility. The study found women undergoing fertility treatments who consume products with high amounts of pesticide residue end up with a lower chance of pregnancy and a higher risk of pregnancy loss. Studies suggest that women should eat fruits and vegetables with a lower pesticide residue, things like avocados, also prunes, or buy organic.
A major battle brewing between Twitter and the CEO of Google, and it deals with the burger emoji. Yeah, okay, so the burger, burger emojis by Apple and Google are sparking controversy yeah. about how their burgers are assembled. The Apple emoji shows lettuce at the bottom of the burger, so that's one on the left, while the Google emoji has cheese at the bottom. People on Twitter say both burgers are stacked incorrectly. Google's CEO jokingly tweeted that he would, quote, drop everything to address the situation, but only if people can agree on a burger formation. Uh, we can't agree on anything. This, this is high-level stuff. I know. Yeah, I know. I know. Either bur burgers should just make you happy. You know, the just... cheese ought to be on the top of the burger, right? Why not on both? Why not one on think, top, one on bottom? There you go. Now we're talking. Solve the problem with two pieces of cheese. <laughs> Google, call me. You know, what? Google, where are you? <laughs> Smile a bit. Uh,